I'd like to take a look at just one game from round six of the European Team Championship. And this is from the Hungary-Norway match, Peter Lerko against Magnus Carlsen. Now, Magnus hasn't had the best of times so far. He has half out of three. And it seems to me whenever Magnus has a little bit of a rough time, then people start to wail and gnash and say he's not really interested in chess and he should change his style and do this and do that. And Anyway, I thought we'd have a look and see how an out-of-form Magnus plays. So, Leko with the white pieces and it's a Spanish. So I think both players in their comfort zone here. Leko has played the white side of the Spanish for I think his entire career, feels very comfortable with it and Carlson wants to keep all the pieces on the board and you know have have a good clean fight. So rookie one of course is the main line here, but Leko does something a little bit different. D3. Well, over the last few years this has gained an excellent reputation. Uh, it's it's very similar to the anti martial systems uh, and often transposes. So by protecting this pawn on e4, white is already threatening to take on c6 and take on e5. So b5, the standard move. And now one can play with a4 or uh, maybe knight d2, but Leko plays knight c3. This is also you know, quite a, a reasonable move, so taking control over d5 d6 from black, so almost symmetrical pawn structure, and after this pawn is defended, now black is threatening to play knight a5 to snap off that bishop, so that's why a3 is played, a4 also possible, but a3 just gives the bishop some room, and rook b8, okay, nice to support this pawn, um, sometimes the b-file opens, and here well, Leko has arrived at this position before and played h3, which looks like a pretty reasonable move to me, just to stop bishop g4, and, and h3 can be useful anyway. Um, but he didn't play that. I also quite like knight d5. That seems to make sense to me as well. Um, you know, you, you, you might follow up later with c3 and d4. But Leko played bishop e3. Um, I have to say I don't like that move. It somehow, I, d I don't think the bishop is, is necessarily on a better square on e3 than c1. Uh, I think it's better just to wait on c1 until it's quite clear where that bishop needs to be. Um, problem with the bishop on e3 is that it's, it, it can be vulnerable sometimes to a knight g4, but also it rather gets in the way. It's, it's often more difficult to force through, oops, sorry, I'm misfiring, force through d4. Uh, with a bishop on e3, it's because e pawn can sometimes lack protection. I know I'm speaking very generally here, but I think it just it seems a little bit premature to me. Magnus played knight a5 and the bishop back, and c5. So straight away he's seizing the initiative actually on the queen side. So with the pawn on c5 and the pawn on e5, that kind of clamps white in the centre, so d4 is definitely not possible for white in this position. Knight d5 looks reasonable, plonking the knight in the middle, and c4 from Magnus, so this is bold strategy from him. Um, Leko now exchanges off knight for bishop, which kind of seems reasonable, so this is kind of the extra bishop if you like. But, of course, this one is rather locked out of the game. Um, Queen d2 from Leko, hitting the knight on a5, which drops back to c6. And here, the move that I would like to play with white is to take on c4 to open up the position for, for the bishops. But this one isn't so clear after knight e4. Uh, it's nice for black to have the centre pawns for a start and and I think you know that the tactics don't quite work for white here um, 
because here the queen is somewhat embarrassed. Um, you know, that, well, I mean, this is a very unclear situation, but uh, the kind of thing I don't think Lecco really would like to head for. Um, instead, he he kept kept the position kind of safe and solid and played h3. Well, h3. Uh, often a useful move to prevent bishop g4, but also knight g4. Bishop e6, so bolstering that pawn, and of course a very nice square for the bishop. Uh, and here, Lecco thought for 20 minutes, and he came up with a move which I th looks to me like a mistake. I think he should play knight g5 and try and um, get that bishop it's possible to drop the bishop back, or if Carlson wanted to play more boldly, he could play d5, trying to really keep that bishop locked out of the game. So, I mean, maybe that's what Lecco was afraid of. Anyway, he played b4. Um, so, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what his intention is. Of course, you, you gain a bit of ground on the queen side, but well, maybe he overlooked Magnus's next move, which is a, which is a superb move. Magnus took 10 minutes over this. It's a very clever idea. Basically, he wants to play c3, which is makes life a little bit uncomfortable. So, for example, um, knight g5 could be met by c3. Now, that can't be taken because of a discovered attack on d4. And after queen e2, the exchange leaves that rook very badly placed. Um, and you know it could be black is following up with d5 at, at some moment but or, or maybe knight d4 but this is actually a very annoying pawn for for white it really sort of divides uh, white's position and for that reason leko actually played c3 here he clearly just wanted to cut out that possibility but this is not good because after this exchange, then you can see basically over the last couple of moves, b4 and c3, Leko has saddled himself with a backward pawn and now Magnus takes the initiative. Very interesting that it's, you know, Magnus spies a couple of tactics, but actually it's all um, in the service of a positional advantage which Magnus now has. So he's using his majority of pawns in the centre to take control. Uh, if that's taken then e4 is very good for black. So Leko drops back with the knight but now it's absolutely clear that Carlsen is taking control very steadily in the position. So the queen looks at the rook, the rook drops back and now knight e7, it's a nice move. So exposing that pawn, which Leko blocks, and the knight swings around to g6. So in blocking the c file, it leaves that square exposed. And now those those knights looking quite quite menacing on the king's side. Rook d1. Now over the next few moves, I like the way Carlson handles this. He does nothing very special, but he doesn't need to. He appreciates that he simply has a positional advantage here because of the weakness of that pawn and just plays absolutely solidly. So let's see, queen f3, the queen steps out of the, the line of the rook. h6, good move. Always nice to, to make sure that your king has an escape square, Luftloch. Rook e1. Well, there's actually no danger here on e5 because the knight protects the pawn and Carlsen is just doubling. Okay, you can avoid the exchange of queens. Queen c6, no problem. And in fact, the queen is seemingly strong here, but actually it can't attack anything. It's only on its own. So black is simply threatening to double on the d5. So Leko exchanged. And now comes a very cool moment in the game. So Carson just continues his doubling. But in order to play like this, 
Carlson had to do a very nifty bit of calculation. So let's see this. There are a couple of possibilities that White has here. First of all, what happens if White exchanges and takes the pawn on e5? Well, there's a neat tactic here. Black wins with rook takes knight. And knight h4 out of the blue wins. Knight attacks the queen, but also threatens g2. Well, queen g2 mate, so black wins. Okay, now the next one is, is really cool. Let's have a look at this. Okay, what happens if knight takes e5? Well, black gives up the queen and gets two rooks for it, but such situations, particularly when, well, white has pretty active pieces now and, and an extra pawn, this is potentially rather unclear, but I'm sure that Magnus had calculated this and realized he was doing very well. Let's see, there's some beautiful lines here. Knight h4, first of all, and that actually asks rather an awkward question of the queen. If queen c2, then rook d1, and this gives black a really very powerful attack. But queen f4 is a critical move, hitting the knight. Well, let's see what happens. This is fantastic. In fact, you can still play rook d1. This rather reminds me of a game that I looked at in the previous round report, uh, where Van Veli lost with white. That was a nice tactic. But let's see what happens here. It's very similar in some ways. So if queen takes knight, then you don't check here but you can play knight e4, preventing the king stepping out. So now rook h1, mate is threatened. And if g4, you give a check, you give another check here. Now if the king goes back to h2, then knight g5 is going to win. That's an unpleasant threat. And if the king steps out, then this move is actually winning. Now, if the king goes forward, then g5 wins a queen. And if the king goes back, then the king is actually caught in a mating net. So, for example, here, um, rook d2, and the king gets mated. I'm sure that Magnus would have calculated this. So, in this position, after rook d8, this rook is threatened. Leko brought the queen back. But now it was very simple for Magnus. He exchanged all the rooks and played knight e4, threatening the bishop and threatening the pawn. And, well, he simply wins a pawn here. And because his position is so solid, there are no difficulties at all. Clear extra pawn and, well, in a few moves, uh, Lecker resigned. No complications. When you play through that game... Um, just superficially, it just looks incredibly smooth. But I hope that uh, I've shown that, in fact, Magnus was working really hard in that game and calculated very accurately indeed to uh, force the win. So there we go. Crisis, what crisis? Magnus is doing OK. Everyone has an off day. Um, I should say that Russia defeated Georgia today, two and a half, one and a half, and... France defeated Ukraine two and a half, one and a half. So that leaves, um, let me see, uh, the big pairing in the next round will be France against Russia. Russia have 11 points, France have 10 points. They're, those, they're in the top two places. Look out for that. Thanks for watching.